Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, we are going through Seneca's moral letters. And today we are covering letters from 31 to 40. And we are going to start with letter 37, which has gotten the maximum number of votes. And then we'll go to letter 32 and so on. So let us start uh, with uh, the, the format is we're going to have a, one reading of the letter and then everybody is invited to comment. After we have finished discussing the letter, we'll go to the next one. Gary, go ahead. All right. It says, you have promised to be a good man. You have enlisted under oath. That is the strongest chain which will hold you to a sound understanding. Any man will be but mocking you if he declares that this is an effeminate and easy kind of soldiering. It will not have you deceived. The words of this most honorable compact are the same as the words of that most disgraceful one, to wit, through burning, imprisonment, or death by the sword. From the men who hire out their strength for the arena, who eat and drink what they must pay for with their blood, security is taken that they will endure such trials, even though they be unwilling. From you, that you will endure them willingly and with alacrity. The gladiator may lower his weapon and test the pity of the people, but you will neither lower your weapon nor beg for life. You must die erect and unyielding. Moreover, what profit is it to gain a few days or a few years? There is no discharge for us from the moment we are born. Then how can I free myself, you ask? You cannot escape necessities, but you can overcome them. By force, a way is made, and this way will be afforded you by philosophy. Betake yourself, therefore, to philosophy if you would be safe, untroubled, happy, in fine, if you wish to be, and that is most important, free. There is no other way to attain this end. Folly is low, abject, mean slavish, and exposed to many of the cruelest passions. These passions, which are heavy taskmasters, sometimes ruling by turns and sometimes together, can be banished from you by wisdom, which is the only real freedom. There is but one path leading thither, and it is a straight path. You will not go astray. Proceed with steady step, and if you would have all things under your control, put yourself under the control of reason. If reason becomes your ruler, you will become ruler over many. You will learn from her what you should undertake and how it should be done. You will not blunder into things. You can show me no man who knows how he began to crave that which he craves. He has not been led to that pass by forethought. He has been driven to it by impulse. Fortune attacks us as often as we attack fortune. It is disgraceful instead of proceeding ahead to be carried along. And then suddenly, amid the whirlpool of events, to ask in a dazed way, how did I get into this condition? Farewell. Thank you, Gary. Hey folks, would love to hear what you think of this letter. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom to talk about this letter. Uh, we're going to start with Evanique. So the thing I like about this letter is that it, in the beginning, it talks about, um, you know, well, you know, like people working and toiling for nothing, right? And it, and you know, like it's like, why are you working? Why are you toiling? You're toiling to get all these things of security, which. I'm paraphrasing, of course, can be taken away at any point in time. Like you could lose your job at any point in time. It, things can happen at any point in time. And that later on, it talks about reason. And that's like the only way, that's the only thing that you really have that you can use to combat this, right? And, and not combat it in the sense of making it go away, but it's the way in which you deal with it. It's through reason. And if you're thinking through reason, um, then that is kind of 
the way to go because that's really the only thing you have is to think reasonably about it and and know the next steps and know how you're going to move forward. Um, in Stoicism, uh, there was a resilience conference and you know it was online, so I attended it. And one of the speakers, Duff, um, uh, she was an MTV VJ back in the nineties, eighties, nineties. Um, but she was saying, you know, she has this disease where she's in constant pain and she was saying all these many things that happened. And she was like, you know, if she hadn't practiced resilience, which is thinking about it before it happens, um, then she would have had nothing. Like if she didn't reason, like, what would I do if this happens? You know, one of the things that she had to do was like get all hardwood floors because, you know, and then the hardwood floors kept warping and she was like, what is there to do? And she was like, well, you just have to go somewhere where it's safe until you can come back. And, there, and the landlord had asked her like, why aren't you as frustrated? Like, why aren't you so frustrated? And she said, what would be the point of being frustrated and, and acting in a way that's frustrated? And she said she learned that through resilience and through the Stoics. And so I think when Seneca talks about it here, his reason is like, it's the only thing that you got. And it doesn't mean that you don't feel the emotion. It's that you don't act out of that emotion, that you act out of, of reason. And no, it's not easy. And no, you don't do it all the time. I, I don't. Um, but it, it's something to strive towards, I think. So um, those were my thoughts. Thank you, Evanique. Next up, uh, folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Would love to hear what you think of this letter. Uh, next up is going to be Maritza, followed by Gary. Maritza. Hi. Um, on, so this, this letter is talking about um, virtue. And I, I think ultimately what the call here is to be true to oneself. And that is the idea of you know, we, in our societal day-to-day, -day, the word promise tends to have a heavy weight attached to it. Maybe less today than in some, and less in some circles than others. But in general, when one uses promise, it's, it is what, as he's stating, it's an oath. And so if one would make a promise to others, why not make the promise to oneself to be something. Um, in general, I know that a lot of um, Stoics don't use, um, they would not necessarily say a good man, because they steer away from good versus bad. But in this context, where it's saying good man, it's actually synonymous with virtuous man. So the idea here is that you're promising yourself that you're going to be true to your innermost principles, virtues, as it were. Um, and here, what I really like is the idea that you, if you don't choose to keep honoring that commitment you've made with yourself, then you're going to just start spinning out wildly. And, you know, he says that in a couple of different ways. And, you know, in the end, it is grace, it, it is disgraceful instead of proceeding ahead to be carried along. There's a reason why when we talk about our forward moving path, we talk about walking that meaningful path. No one wants to be carried along their meaningful path. I think the word meaning kind of falls off if you're being carried or pushed or shoved or you find yourself on the wrong path, right? All of these things are things that happen occasionally. But your reset or your regroup, when you're grounding force, is if you know the path you wish to be walking, even if you find yourself sidelined, veer back towards that path. And then you're going to keep having this. I love the way that this very first um, the subject, the title was written, on allegiance to virtue. Because it's not just saying that you're going to make a promise to be a virtuous human. You have to re-say that. You have to recommit. And the hardest time to recommit is when everything has gone sideways. 
Um, and it's so easy, you know, Evan was just talking about that, you know, when life throws this, you know, curve at you, there are so many things one can do. And if one just wallows or allows our emotions to take over, then there's no room for us to remember that we're attempting to be true to ourselves. Because now you're out of the any realm of thinking. Um, and I believe that's what he's saying. I'd like to remind everyone that when Stoics use the passions, they are not just talking about our natural emotions. We are at our very core, you know, humans are emotional beings. We're, you know, animal creatures. What they're speaking of when they speak of the passions, anything in excess, you know, if you are doing things in moderation, that's not what they're talking about. The passions are the overly strong emotions that are taking you out of the capability to use any aspects of thinking and reasoning. Because if you have no reason, then you're truly just animal. And we are never just animal, even though that also exists within us. So I, I really love the forceful way he ends this letter by talking about, you know, you're just going to be, it's disgraceful to be like carried along. And then when you stop spinning, when you allowed yourself to get carried away, you're like, well, how the heck did I get here? And to me, that's a great check for us. If we find ourselves going, what the heck, how did I get here? Maybe it's time to pause, regroup, and realize that somewhere you lost your way from the promise you made to yourself. And that's the perfect starting point to recommit to having this allegiance with your own virtuous inner core and then move forward from there, regroup as it were. Um, that This letter is especially great for that because it doesn't, he doesn't make it seem like it's a finite condition. You know, you're going to be doing well and you may find yourself here, but there's always room. It's just a matter of finding that reasoning in order to get you back and out of the whirlpool that he calls it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, folks would love to hear from anybody who wants to comment on this uh, letter. Um, next up is going to be Gary. Gary, go ahead. Hello. Um, I was actually um, kind of taken by how much of there was overlap with just this letter and everything we covered when we did Gospel of John. And so like in my head, as I'm reading through this, you know, when he says reason, I'm being reminded that they're using the same word, the logos, you know, and the idea of reason. And then I'm, I'm also um, thinking of Stoic metaphysics and cosmology and how the whole argument of the Gospel of John begins with the cosmology there. And, and so it, it's, as I'm learning about Stoicism, I'm looking into it and it, there's, there's all of this really, really profound overlap that's, um, that I never noticed before. So I'm really enjoying this, this letter. Um, I think what stood out to me was, was again, something that we talked about in the Gospel of John as the virtues as being both necessary and sufficient. And in this letter, he makes that point, I think, really strongly that you're going to fight and you're going to die because that's that's just all of us die anyways. And so the virtues are in themselves sufficient for us to continue to to endure. Um, and I believe I was just listening to a biography on Seneca today that that's he had to end his own life at the order of the um, emperor. And so there was this idea of here he is. He's just like he's accepting this is the way it is. Um, and so I, it's when you see a life that that lives itself out and lives it to the end and has some level of consistency there, um, it just adds so much more to all the teachings. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of new at all of this, um, but already seeing the overlap. And um, Shrikant, I think I sent you an, um, a link earlier to a video. I, is it appropriate for me to share that in the chat? Sure, go ahead. Um, it's just kind of, it was really helpful to me because it was an overview of stoicism and it highlighted not just, um, 
like like Evan Eek, I, I got exposed to um, stoicism when I was working in psych and I had to teach um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And so I spent years teaching rational emotive behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy to all of my students that were psych patients and they were trapped and they couldn't get away. And so I had a captive audience. And, and so I got a lot of exposure to stoicism because they would frequently refer back to the stoics, to Epictetus and to uh, Seneca, you know, for all of this stuff. And so I'm, stoicism is in the water of modern psychology, absolutely. Um, and so hearing Evanique talk about it and seeing how it resonated in this letter, it, that that's, I'm gonna stop there because I'm just babbling now, but I, like I'm just taken by how much overlap there is with just what I've learned in psych, what I taught in psych, what we covered in the gospel of John and what's what's even in just this little letter. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary. Does anybody else want to comment on this letter? Go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Otherwise, we're going to go to number 32. And uh, the reader is going to be Maritza and Evanik, if you could share. And after 32, there are four other letters. And we're going to get one more chance. People who have come in late get to vote on one of the four letters. So uh, everybody gets to vote on the four letters. But we're going to start with uh, number 32. And the reader is going to be Marissa and Evanik, if you could share the screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. Go ahead, Marissa. On progress, letter 32. I have been asking about you and inquiring of everyone comes from your part of the country, what you are doing and where you are spending your time and with whom. You cannot deceive me for I am with you. Live just as if I were sure to get news of your doings, nay, as if I were sure to behold them. And if you wonder what particularly pleases me that I hear concerning you, it is that I hear nothing that most of those whom I ask do not know what you are doing. This is sound practice, to refrain from associating with men of different stamp and different aims. And I am indeed confident that you cannot be warped, that you will stick to your purpose, even though the crowd may surround and seek to distract you. What then is on my mind? I am not afraid lest they work a change in you, but I am afraid lest they may hinder your progress. And much harm is done even by one who holds you back, especially since life is so short and we make it still shorter by our unsteadiness, by making ever fresh beginnings at life, now one and immediately another. We break up life into little bits and fritter it away. Hasten ahead then, dearest Lucilius, and reflect how greatly you would quicken your speed if an enemy were at your back, or if you sus suspected the cavalry were approaching and pressing hard upon your steps as you fled. It is true, the enemy is indeed pressing upon you, you should therefore increase your speed and escape away and reach a safe position, remembering continually what a noble thing it is to round out your life before death comes, and then await in peace the remaining portion of your time, claiming nothing for yourself, since you are in possession of the happy life, for such a life is not made happier for being longer. Oh, when shall you see the time when you shall know what ti that time means nothing to you, when, when you shall be peaceful and calm, careless of the morrow, because you are enjoying your life to the full? Would you know what makes men greedy for the future? It is because no one has yet found himself. Your parents, 
to be sure, asked other blessings for you. But I myself pray rather that you may despise all those things which your parents wished for you in abundance. Their prayers plunder many another person, simply that you may be enriched. Whatever they make over to you must be removed from someone else. I pray that you may get such control over yourself that your mind, now shaken by wandering thoughts, may at last come to rest and be steadfast, that it may be content, that it may be content with itself, and having attained an understanding of what things are truly good, and they are in our possession as soon as we have this knowledge that it may have no need of added years. He has at length passed beyond all necessities. He has won his honorable discharge and is free, who still lives after his life has been completed. Farewell. Uh, thank you, Maritza. Uh, all right, folks, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on this letter. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. I'll start with uh, Emanique. Yeah, um, I actually like the part where, you know, he talks about in the beginning, you know, that he's with like-minded people or he's with people that are focusing on his goals and that too many people outside of that group don't know his goals, right? And so for me, I looked at it as like, it was, um, I feel like that's kind of what we do in our, not not that what we do, but I think it's like, you have to find people that are, going the direction that you want to go and if people are wanting to go in a different direction and they want to steer you a different way or they may not even want to steer you a different way but they're not going you kind of don't have a lot of comment in them and I think it helps you connect to the other person when you have you know similar ideas or you like to discuss ideas or you know like your life is going in that same tra trajectory I think you get more meaningful relationships and like you said uh, like Seneca said, that it doesn't hinder you from your goals. Um, it doesn't hinder you from where you're going or your direction. Um, I was listening to something yesterday. It was a podcast about money, but the focus, he said, the speaker was saying, is it money? It's what do you want to do with your life? Like, what do you want to achieve? Like, and he was like, no small dreams. Like, if you could have anything you want, what is that? And then he's like, then you figure out how to get there. And one of the things that he mentioned is you look at people that have done what you've done and you go to them and you ask them, how did they get there? How did they do it? How did they achieve it? And then you look at your life and do it. And I think that's the key is like, where do you want to go? And then like, once you've achieved that thing, of course, there are going to be different goals. You're going to meet different people along your path in life. But the main thing that you are focusing on is like, how do I get there? You know what I mean? So, you know, and, you know, how are the people in my life helping me to get to that place? And if they're not, are they directing me the opposite way? And if so, either you limit your interaction with them or you just come, like, if I think if they're consciously derailing your goals, this is my point. If they're consciously derailing your goals, then, you know, you kind of have to cut them off. But if they're not consciously derailing your goals, but they're not helping you to go where you need to go, then maybe you you kind of have to limit your interaction with them. That way you can keep focus. So um, that those were my thoughts. Thank you, Evanique. Thank you. Um, folks, if you'd like to comment, go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. I would love to hear from as many people as would like to speak.
Good shot. Maybe we should read it again. Um, let's no. Let, let's oh. see. Uh, Maritza, go ahead. Hi. Um. So there's. I have a. Um. So when I was a little girl, my mom used to say um something. It was kind of like a Spanish, uh, not a proverb, but a saying. Um, she used to say often, and um, you know, it's uh, "Dime con quién andas y te cuento quién eres." And the uh, rough translation is, tell me with whom you walk and I'll tell you who you are. Um, that's what I hear in this passage here in this letter. The idea that for all of one's good intentions, it's so very easy to get caught up in um, the thinking of another. It's one thing to um, kind of have discourse and interactions with them, but when you are walking with them as it were you know it's like we we're just talking about in the previous letter you know it's so it's so very easy to get derailed from your path that um if you're walking with someone they might be slowing you down or that you might be veering off course if if they're not you know similarly minded um, and I don't think he means similarly minded from a very rigid perspective of you know you don't want to ever interact with anyone who has different ideas. I think it's more of a, again, we're talking about, you know, moral. So it's, you can have different ideas or different philosophies, but if your inner core, your, your virtue is similar to the other person's virtue, then that's, those are the types of people with whom you wish to ally yourself. Um, in um, some of her, her writings, you know, a Ayn Rand talks about how, the, she views the idea of friendship or any relationship, a desire to see one's values reflected in the other person. Um, that's what I'm hearing here. Those are the types of people with whom one should ally oneself. You know, if you are seeing your virtues reflected back at you, this is probably not someone who's going to be slowing you down. Um, but if you don't see your values reflected back at you, then you're going, this might be someone who's hindering your pro, your progress. Um, so that's that's kind of just my couple of thoughts on this. Thank you, thank you, Marissa. Uh, folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to comment on this letter on progress. Next up is going to be Rochine. Rochine, go ahead. I've been thinking lately. I've been realizing that. I live in pretty much a bubble of people who think like I do. Um, it, there are sort of overlaps with bubbles or you know, people who are like me socioeconomically or given where I live um, racially, language and everything. And I guess I'm trying to figure out how to balance uh, being open and exposed to other people, which I keep hearing about as maybe a way out of some of the disunity and conflict in our culture with finding people that you do want to hang around with because of the values you already have. I don't have an answer, but I certainly do know from my past that you can get into trouble spending too much time with people with values that are contrary to yours, values that are different. I don't know, I'm confused. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rochine. Um, I, I'll make a couple of comments. No, actually, I'm, I'm gonna hold off until uh, it's going to be Joe, Gary, and Shane Martin. Joe. Yeah, so um, in reading this, uh, this is strictly about, I see, knowing what the difference between what is good and what is bad. You know, what is worth pursuing, what is not worth pursuing. Uh, the idea that knowledge is something that is worth pursuing. You're pursuing, uh, I think, it says it in the uh, somewhere in the end here. Uh, I'll, I'll come to it in a minute. I just saw it. Oh, yeah. 
and that uh, and they are in our possession as soon as we have this knowledge uh, that we may, may have and need added years. He has that length beyond past beyond all necessities. He has won his honorable discharge and is free. Um, so this is essentially, yeah, I, I think that again, and he also talks about a person that is greedy. Um, uh, and so if you think about it in those terms that they don't necessarily know what's good and what's worth pursuing. So if you think in terms of virtue is the thing that is the word worth pursuing, it is the good in and of itself. So it's intrinsic value is there so that it's the reward. Um, it is the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's essential to a stoic and a happy life. And that's what he's telling Lucilius is not to manage himself to external circumstances or externals in general. Um, and, uh, and to know what is valuable and what ultimately for Stoics, that is, you know, to pursue virtue, but to know what's most important, your own personal values is important as, as well. Um, and that this is the path uh, to happiness. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, glad, to, glad to have you here. Uh, we, we we're missing you. It's like, what is Stoicism without, without Joe? So uh, next up is going to be Gary, Shane Murray and Martha. Gary. Um, the part that really stuck out to me was when he said, hasten ahead then um, and reflect how greatly you would quicken your, your pace, your speed, if an enemy were at your back or if you suspected the cavalry were approaching and pressing hard upon your steps as you fled. Um, and then goes on to say that uh, a life is not made greater for having been longer. And so I just really like that, that aspect of this idea of, of um, I think to me, it harkens back to that whole idea of virtue is sufficient, both necessary and sufficient in and of itself. If you have that, you've achieved the thing that you're, you're, you're yearning for. You've achieved that you would, you would um, you know, that happiness. Um, it's right there. It's not something in the distant future that you're only going to get if you have wealth or accomplishment or excellence or any of those other things. It's, it's, it's within your grasp. That is the thing that's worth pursuing. Um, and none of the, it's not contingent upon any of these other aspirations. And so that's, that's the part that really kind of stuck out to me. Um, especially in the context of taking care of my dad and our healthcare system just to personalize it, it's like, oh, we have somebody who is old and who's dying. Do we maintain their life at all costs, no matter what? And even my dad is like, well, you know, at some point, you know, we'll, we'll just stop here because you need to have quality of life. You know, it needs, it needs to be happy. It's not better for being longer. And so that, that really stuck out to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Shane Murray, Martha, and Paul. Shane Murray. Uh, yes, I was uh, really intrigued um, when he gives indication as to what makes a person greedy for the future, um, and he suggests it because no one has yet found themselves. And so it 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 <laughs> makes me think in in the sense that I'm greedy for the future, or wanting more time to come. That that's an an indicator that I've yet to find sufficiently something in myself that allows me to be careless of the morrow, as he suggests. So I, I think that's very helpful. Um, it, it, it sounds that he's suggesting that you can, in fact, be peaceful of the time you have, even if it ends today, if you found yourself. So it's a nice, I think, indicator of the path. Wonderful. Great, great observation. Thank you. Thank you, Shane Marie. Next up is Martha, followed by Paul. Martha. Hi, apologies for um, joining a little late and um, but because of that I started out on the passage about parents and not doing not um, taking what your parents are, are wishing for you which I thought was interesting my first thought on it was about um, not not let it like they're they're probably wishing for um, 
obviously there's the living vicariously, them living vicariously through you. And, and that's not something we want, but also this thought that uh, what they want for me is to have money, to have a good job, to have a home and, and all things that are uh, wonderful and useful for comfort, but all things that can be taken away as well. And just kind of in line with some of the other readings that I've been doing of late, which is like, they're not, parents aren't usually thinking or just trying to encourage you to, to uh, enrich your, your virtues, your soul, your your peace of mind, that, that thing that no one else can remove from you. And so that was kind of cool to, to see it in that light too. And, and just trying to put that forward for the future and, and keep working on myself in that light. Wonderful. Great, great observations. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, next up is Paul. Paul, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Rogine's point really got me thinking because in this age of alienation and polarization, we're all doing what a lot of people are doing what Regine said and just staying in their groups and almost what might look in the surface like following what this is talking about, like Maritza said, be careful you walk with. Certainly you wouldn't want to walk with someone on the opposite political pole, but that I'm just pointing out that it could be interpreted differently that if the high virtue might be considered spreading what you believe is very important to people who may not agree with it, then you're going to walk amongst those people, but you're going to and, and get to know them. But you won't fall into the trap of some of the people who try to infiltrate cults, for instance, but then become a member of the cult, because you're bringing with you your own brethren, your own, you've built a, a group of people that you're very strong in and you're very strong in yourself. And then you bring that to the opposite pole and you do get to know them and you do try to understand them. That's a high virtue. So I don't think they're contradictory is my point. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. Great, great point. Uh, let's go to Maritza and then it'll be me. Just Maritza. a quick, quick uh, thing. Um, you know, I, I think it's a very, um, important distinction that Paul just touched upon, the idea of walking among and walking with. So it's one thing to kind of walk among a group of people whom you're looking at and not seeing your values reflected. It's an entirely different thing to have them walking alongside you and you're walking with them. Because remember when we're talking of walking, we're speaking of your forward movement, your progress in life. And so I, I think that it's that's a, that's a great distinction that I don't believe the admonition here is to not ever to be a, among people with different views, but it's the caution to not start walking with them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. So I want to comment on both these, you know, just all the observations that everybody made on both these letters. Um, and then again, I'm going to open it up for any comments anybody else has. Um, and then we'll go and vote on the next four letters. Um, in both these pieces, I see that it is really about a notion of virtue, which is the heart of both these pieces. Um, and you can look at that notion of virtue as compared to our notion of what is good, how we think about our lives and compare it to that. And you can see how, how different it is. Firstly, the first letter it talks about inner versus outer. And he's saying, don't get distracted by outer things that are going on. Keep focused on the inner, the repose that you have in your principles in the core of your being. Don't chase after other you know, random things just because they are there. Don't react. Don't be reactive. Be proactive from the core of your being. So don't look at the externalities. Don't be attached to the externalities. Stand in the center of your being and act 
from it in the way in which you should. So there is this inner and outer play. Second, there is a play between repose and activity. It says, don't just chase after things, you know? It's like a dog saying, oh, look, that is something interesting. That's something interesting. That's something interesting. Have the repose, you know, have the, have a stable center which remains focused on the good of your notion of virtues, of your understanding of the world. And don't be, you know, moved hither and thither. Another way of looking at it is that everything that you want in life, try to achieve it now, in this moment itself. Don't say that I'm going to do it later on because in some ways it is a cop out. Because you are not respecting the sacredness and sanctity of your consciousness, of your awareness, of your presence. By saying that, oh, I will pursue this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. You're stopping from being your moral ideal now. So there is this now, inner, virtue, um, repose. And I want to relate to the point about people. He's actually saying something very different than what us moderns hear in what he's saying. One of the core ideas of Stoicism is the idea of cosmopolitan, of being open to everybody. What he's saying is that not He's not saying that be with your group. He's actually saying be with virtue. Identify what is virtue, what is repose in you. Figure out whether the other person has repose. Remember in the first selection that we did, there was a letter on friendship and he's saying it was all the point was of repose. He's saying, look for people who have the same repose, who rest in the same virtue and be with them and be very open with them and interact intensely with them. So he's saying, and don't chase after others. So it's not about the group. It is about virtue. So it is a very profound different way of thinking. It is primacy of virtue. It is primacy of your own consciousness, of your own will, of your proactiveness. It is about sanctity of the present and saying that that is what matters. And don't be distracted by other things. So those are my thoughts. would love to hear any comments? Um, we're going to start with Evanique. Yeah, um, when you were talking, Strickland, what I got present to do was being present and in that, in the moment and, you know, thinking of it, like, you know, for some people, like thinking they're going to die at every moment would just cause panic and anxiety, right? But if you think this is, if you think of it as almost like, You'll never get this moment back. You'll never be in this moment in time again. You'll never be present with this exact group of people. Like let's say tonight, for instance, you'll never be present with this group of people ever again in this combination, in this way, talking about these uh, these letters, you know, and really just being present and paying attention to what each person has to say. And at the same time, also being present to that, you know, you got to take steps to what you want out of life now. Like, why prevent it? You know, like, what are you waiting for? Um, 
uh, someone had said something about um it was a great line you know um and i'm paraphrasing because i can't remember it but it's basically saying this is all you get right here at this moment nothing else is guaranteed but this moment why not start working towards what you want now you know you can live a fulfilled life if you're working towards what you want. And I, and I think that's key is, is that what you're doing, is it getting you closer to your goal, whatever it is, it's the action that you're taking and really being present to it. Because I think a lot of times we all, and I think this is throughout history, we've gone on autopilot. Most of us do it. It's, it's kind of like what's counted on that we're going to do the autopilot thing, that we're going to get up in the morning, we're going to go to work, we're going to come home, and we're going to like have the same type of day, like kind of like Groundhog Day, right? You know, you're just going to keep going around and around and around until you're present to, I'm going to take these steps, and these steps are leading me towards this thing that I want to achieve, because I know it'll bring fulfillment. And by working towards that, you are already living in that, living the life that you want because you're working towards what you want or what you think your life should be. And I think, so that's when, when you were talking, that really got me present to it. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Next up is Jill. So just one of the lines that actually had stuck, uh, you know, now that I've heard you speak and I had a chance to actually, uh, look at it a little bit more closely uh and i am indeed confident that you cannot be warped that you will you will stick to your purpose even though the crowd may surround and seek to distract you um and this is what is one of the most important things to i think with uh that resonates with me with stoicism is that you will stick to your principles what is what you think is right in that particular moment in time and not necessarily be influenced by external circumstances. So if you know that something's wrong and you and the crowd's going along with it, that you're not necessarily gonna follow the crowd. And that is, a, to me, um, uh, an essential part of ethical behavior uh, because sometimes we know there's something you know that we shouldn't be doing, but we do it because everybody else is doing it. And so it really, um, to me, that's what it, and that speaks to the deeper point is then what is good? What is the good thing? What is knowing what is good to pursue? Uh, and that is why understanding that virtue is, is your goal. Uh, what is a virtuous action that aligns with your values? that is that's the right action to take is the action just you know is the action wise um you know are you demonstrating courage uh so that will lead you to be uncompromising N not in a, in a not maybe uncompromising is the wrong word but at least uh where you're steadfast um in 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 your beliefs so I think that that's, uh, and, and again, I think that this is essential with Stoicism to what has actually attracted me to Stoicism, because it's not just Seneca that talks about this. This is also spoken about with Epictetus quite a bit too, about not going along with the crowd, um, and as well as Marcus Aurelius. But I mean, those, but Epictetus uh, sticks out uh, to me here as well. Um, so anyway, I just thought I would add that on. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I want to make one more comment. Um, uh, Evanik, while I'm doing that, can you put the next the four ones that were tied, both numbers, and then if you can, just the titles of those as well. Uh, folks, we're going to vote on those. Um, oh, there it is. Well, that was quick. That was quick. Okay. I was prepared. <laughs> yeah, this is amazing meetup. You know, it's like you think of something and somebody just does it. That's just incredible. Um, so one last comment I want to make, and that is about the psychological state, which is implicit and which you feel throughout here. 
you see a sense of peace, sense of serenity. That is the psychological concomitant as opposed to this frenzied approach. Um, you're just, it, it just gives you so much peace uh, because it is coming, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're resting basically in a place where you can. All right, so folks, go ahead and uh, vote. You can vote for, um, you know, let's take only one vote. Let's do, uh, let's do one if possible. So we can just take the first. Uh, so Martha and John, if you want to change it to just one, choose your favorite one, and then we will take all the votes. Go ahead, folks, vote. And then we will go in the order. We'll start with the one with maximum votes, and then we'll go to the second one. Uh, just of those four. So you can choose between, uh, let's see, and Gary and Ebony, if you could uh, do the tally, uh, 33, 35, 38, or 40. Choose your favorite. There is no, no competition here to 33. It's just rolling. Okay. Um, so folks, go ahead. Um, we're going to go. Um, okay. Very good. So um all right so you uh you can keep voting um and we're going to go ahead and uh yes thank you thank you michael for coming back for stoic uh, thursdays after the stoic saturdays we used to we used to do over a year ago so uh great to have you here thank you um all right so let's start with 33 and we're going to have uh shane murray read um, Ebony, could you go ahead and share the screen? And uh, Shane Murray, are you ready to read? Let me see if Shane Murray. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Just give me a second. Um, Sorry, guys. I problem. I had it up. Let's see. Huh. Oh, there it is. Okay. Do you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, on the futility of learning maxims. You wish me to close these letters also as I closed my former letters with certain utterances taken from the chiefs of your school, but they did not interest themselves in choice extracts. The whole texture of their work is full of strength. There is unevenness, you know, when some objects rise conspicuous above others. A single tree is not remarkable if the whole forest rises to the same height. Poetry is crammed with utterances of this sort, and so is history. For this reason, I would not have you think that these utterances belong to Epicurus. They are common property and are emphatically our own. They are, however, more noteworthy in Epicurus because they appear at infrequent intervals and when you do not expect them. And because it is surprising that brave words should be spoken at any time by a man who made a practice of being effeminate. For that is what most persons maintain. In my own opinion, however, Epic Epicurus is really a brave man, even though he did wear long sleeves. Fortitude, energy, and readiness for battle are to be found among the Persians, just as much as among men who have girded themselves up high. Therefore, you need not call upon me for extracts and quotations. Such thoughts as one may extract here and there in the works of other philosophers run through the whole body of our writings. Hence, we have no show window goods. Nor do we deceive the purchaser in such a way that if he enters our shop, he will find nothing except that which is displayed in the window. We allow the purchasers themselves to get their samples from anywhere they please. Suppose we should desire to sort out each separate model from the general stock. To whom shall we credit them? To Zeno, Cleanthes, Chrysippus, Panaceus, or Posidinus? I apologize, I'm not sure of those names. Um, we Stoics are not subjects of a despo. I'm not sure how to say that either, um, of a despo. Each of us lays claim to his own freedom. 
With them, on the other hand, whatever Hermarchus says or Metrodorus is ascribed to one source. In that brotherhood, everything that any man utters is spoken under the leadership and commanding authority of one alone. We cannot, I maintain, no matter how we try, pick out anything from so great a multitude of things equally good. Only the poor man counts his flock. Wherever you direct your gaze, you will meet with something that might stand out from the rest if the context in which you read it were not equally notable. For this reason, giving over, hoping that you can skim by means of epitomes, the wisdom of distinguished men. Look into their wisdom as a whole, study it as a whole. They are working out a plan and weaving together, line upon line, a masterpiece from which nothing can be taken away without injury to the whole. Examine the separate parts if you like, provided you examine them as parts of the man himself. She is not a beautiful woman whose ankle or arm is praised, but she whose general appearance makes you forget to admire her single attributes. If you insist, however, I shall not be niggardly with you, but lavish, for there is a huge multitude of these passages. They are scattered about in profusion. They do not need to be gathered together, but merely to be picked up. They do not drip forth occasionally. They flow continuously. They are unbroken and are closely connected. Doubtless, they would be of much benefit to those who are still novices and worshiping outside the shrine. For single maxims sink in more easily when they are marked off and bounded like a line of verse. That is why we give to children a proverb, or that which the Greeks call kriya, to be learned by heart. That sort of thing can be comprehended by the young mind, which cannot as yet hold more. For a man, however, whose progress is definite, to chase after choice extracts and to prop his weakness by the best known and the briefest sayings and to depend upon his memory is disgraceful. It is time for him to lean on himself. He should make such maxims and not memorize them. For it is disgraceful even for an old man or one who has cited old age to have a notebook knowledge. This is what Zeno said. But what have you yourself said? This is the opinion of Cleanthus. But what is your own opinion? How long shall you march under another man's orders? Take command and utter some word with posterity, which posterity will remember. Put forth something from your own stock. For this reason, I hold that there is nothing of eminence in all such men as these, who never create anything themselves, but always lurk in the shadow of others, playing the role of interpreters, never daring to put once into practice what they've been so long in learning. They have exercised their memories on other men's material, but it is one thing to remember, another to know. Remembering is merely safeguarding something entrusted to the memory. Knowing, however, means making everything your own. It means not depending upon the copy and not all the time glancing back at the master. Thus said Zeno, but thus said Cleanthus, indeed, let there be a difference between yourself and your book. How long shall you be a learner? From now on, be a teacher as well. But why, one asks, should I have to continue hearing lectures on what I can read? The living voice, one replies, is a great help. Perhaps, but not the voice which merely makes itself the mouthpiece of another's words and only performs the duty of a reporter. Consider this fact also. Those who have never attained their mental independence begin, in the first place, by following the leader in cases where everyone has deserted the leader. Then, in the second place, they follow him in matters where the truth is still being investigated. However, the truth will never be discovered if we rest contented with discoveries already made. Besides, he who follows another not only discovers nothing, but is not even investigating. What then? Shall I not follow in the footsteps of my predecessors? I shall indeed use the old road, but if I find one that makes a shorter cut and is smoother to travel, I shall open the new road. Men who have made these discoveries before us are not our masters, but our guides. Truth lies open for all. It has not yet been monopolized, and there is plenty of it left, even for posterity to discover. Farewell. Thank you. Thank you, Shane Murray. All right, folks, would love to hear what you think. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Let's start with Evanique. Go ahead. Yeah, some of the things I loved in this passage was one um, about knowledge. And, you know, um, knowledge is something that you own. And I think information is something that you can never own, right? But how you use it is something that you own. It is your own. And I think 
I loved Seneca in this passage because he's teaching us you can learn a lot of things, you know. Um, in the Bible, we talk about, you know, biblical scholars that know a lot of scriptures, but it, they don't know how to apply them. And I think that's key. When you have information, um, what makes it knowledge is the application of it. And how do you apply it to yourself? And I think that's when Seneca says you own it because you can apply it to yourself. And I think um, at the end where Seneca talks about our mentors not being our masters, but our guides. And I think that's true as well. You know, he was talking about people who quote uh, uh, Zenu and who someone who quotes someone else. And he's like, well, what's the point of that? And it's so funny, like Gary, I'm like, there are parallels in the Bible. Paul talks about it in, I forget if it's Acts or Romans, um, where he's talking about what people are like, you know, saying, oh, well, uh, I was baptized by Paul and, oh, I was baptized by, you know, Apollos. And Paul's like, what does it matter? Like, we're just people. It's really, thank you, Gary. Uh, it's one Corinthians. And, you know, they're so proud to be baptized by these people and they've taken the place of God. And I think, you know, there's there's people in this passage and, and you know, I just assume from the letters that people are talking about, you know, who they were educated by or who they learned from or, you know, who and it's like, doesn't matter. And it's like, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to apply it? You know, and, I, and the, the last part where he talks about, you know, if there's a shorter and straighter road to get to where I'm going, I'm going to build that road because why make it hard on yourself unnecessarily? Sometimes I think we take the difficult way just to take the difficult way and just to say that we got to it and we it wasn't easy. Like we always like to say, oh, it wasn't easy for us to get there, but why can it be easy if if you have the choice and it's going to get you to the same place with, you know, without, you know, compromising your morals or your values, why not take the easier road? Like, it just makes no sense not to. So, um, yeah, so that's some of the things that I got. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Uh, folks would love to hear from uh, everybody about what they thought of this uh, letter. Next up is going to be Chuf. Um, so yes, and just reviewing this, can you hear me actually? Okay, okay good. Um, and just reviewing this, uh, I, you know, take this as essentially, um, don't simply recite what others think, you know, that's not, you know, the way of actually learning. You're just repeating what someone else says. And that is a, problem when it comes to learning um, in the sense that you're not necessarily phrasing things uh, in a way that are in your own words. Come up with your own ideas and analyze what has been read. Don't necessarily just memorize things. This is something that is actually, and this is a problem with maxims in general. Now, I will say this. I do disagree to a certain extent that maxims can be used in certain circumstances to remind yourself not to assent to certain impressions. That is, that is, a, that is a practice uh, that many Stokes will use um, and, and I think it's a healthy practice. However, that's not what he's referring to. What he's actually referring to in this particular instance is to just not regurgitate information that you don't necessarily understand. And we actually, we had asked you one day, uh, not too long ago, and I said, you know, I said, I need to rewrite something in my own words. And I said, do you think that that's a good idea? And you should, you should be doing that with everything. Uh, that's what Seneca is essentially saying here um, in so many words. Uh, and so, um, and this does uh, prevent you from uh, just being dogmatic as well. You know, you're only adhering to a set of words within a specific context at, at one particular moment in time. So, um, uh, you know, it's also, you're, you know, finding your own personal path too. It's just 
part of self-discovery. Um, and, and so people will often seek out individual passages uh, of something to prove their points, but that is not necessarily proving the point. It hasn't been well articulated and well thought out. Um, and so this is, and I would actually go so far as to say, this is a problem with education in general. When we're asking for answers, but we're not necessarily asking for people to explain those answers or ask good questions, which is really what Seneca is getting to here is that ask these questions, answer these questions yourself. And that will be part of your intellectual growth and your search for knowledge and your quest for wisdom. So I think that that is, a, uh, it's a very powerful passage, but ignoring all maxims, uh, um, uh, would, I would advise against because it could be very helpful as far as, as not assenting to impressions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Great observations. Next up is going to be Maritza, followed by Shane Murray. Maritza. Hi. Um, I think uh, this passage, as with um, most Stoic writings, it's also really helpful to keep in mind that in general, when they're speaking, they're speaking of avoiding um, extremes. So everything in, that, in moderation. I feel like that's almost an axiomatic concept when looking at anything about Stoicism. Um, what comes to mind here actually is, um, you know, some of the um, things that we went through together here with Jordan Peterson. He spoke about rule breaking and his idea was that um, rules are there for a reason and that you should, you're only allowed to break them if you are a master or if you have mastered the rule as it were. And he says, if you're not, then don't confuse your ignorance with creativity or style. And, but he goes further on to talk about how those who break the rules ethically are those who have mastered them first and disciplined themselves to understand the necessity of those rules and to break them in keeping with the spirit rather, rather than the letter of the law. I uh, think this is, so this came to mind based on what Joe was just saying. Like, that's what I hear in this. I, I'm not convinced that the call in this letter is to, you know, forsake all maxims. It's the idea of, um, what is it? Judis, judicious judgments, as it were. You, you are, um, you know, we should not, so blind faith in anything is dangerous. But, and so that's basically what we're being told in this letter. But I don't think that the takeaway here is like to eschew all maxims. So I would agree with, with Joe here that it's rather, it's the idea of, you know, learn what this is. Once you believe you've learned it, now, practice your own judgment. Use your own thoughts to determine where this falls within your virtue system and then act accordingly. So that's what I see here. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Um, next up is going to be Shane Murray followed by Joe. Shane Murray. Yes, so two separate things stood out very strongly. For me, for me here. One is when he mentioned lurking in the shadow of others. And I think, you know, that's can be obvious for people who, you know, clearly do not tend to think for themselves. But I think it's also the case that a lot of times, many of us who don't feel as though we're look, lurking in the shadows of others are in fact, and I think that sometimes can be very difficult to know that uh, where you're looking in the shadows of others, even when you have a deep interest not to lurk in the shadow of others. I think there's quite a call on one's life to extend oneself to the point that they're not lurking in some kind of shadow. Um, so I, I think it's, it's quite challenging. And then the other thing that stood out to me is, he says, how long shall you be a learner? And I think sometimes too, we settle into the learning path, which is deeply enjoyable. Uh, but we we can tend to settle there. Um, it's very satisfying in many ways, and we never kind of place the deeper call in our lives to step out and become the teacher as well as he suggests. Thank you.
Should we count your meat? Sorry about that. Um, Evany, can you, I need to take a call. Can you go ahead and handle the moderating? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, up next, I have Joe. Yeah, so just very briefly, uh, one of the things that uh, is also covered in this is how we look at things as a whole. And if you're taking and extracting specific maxims and quotes from something and just focusing on one particular statement, you're focusing on the part. And what is essentially uh, uh, Seneca is talking about here is, is essentially uh, that uh, look into their wisdom as the whole study, it, it study it, it as a whole. Uh, and so I think that that is actually when we're sometimes just taking something out of context, sometimes to even prove a point, um, it actually doesn't necessarily truly represent what someone was actually even saying. So uh, I think that's another reason they say that um, as well. Uh, the other thing is that there is um, uh, the element of what we actually uh, uh, can control and we can control our opinions about and form our own thoughts. So that is actually something that uh, Stoics obviously value and our own judgment, forming our own judgment. Uh, so it's also taking advantage of um, uh, what our, our gifts are. Um, anyway, that's just a really quick thought I had to add on to what has already been said. Thank you, Joe. Um, up next, I'm oh, sorry. Um, if no one else has any questions or comments, I think we actually have time for one more letter. And uh, I think by my count, and Gary, please let me know if I'm off. I think our next highest one was 40. Um, if that's the case, do you wanna read? Uh, do you wanna do, and I think we could do a letter. Yep, okay. So I think we're gonna do, go ahead and go to 40. Um, does anybody wanna read that? If not, I can, it's, it's no problem at all. All right, I can read, so let me just pull it up. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, letter 40, on the proper style for a philosopher's discourse. I thank you for writing to me so often, for you are revealing your real self to me and the only way you can. I never receive a letter from you without being in your company forthwith. If the pictures of our absent friends are pleasing to us, though they only refresh the memory and lighten our longing by a solace that is unreal and unsubstantial, how much more pleasant is a letter, which brings us real traces, real evidences of an absent friend. For that, for that which is sweetest when we meet face to face is afforded by the impress of a friend's hand upon his letter, recognition. You write me that you heard a lecture by the philosopher Serapio when he landed at your present place of residence. He is wont, you say, to wrench up his words with a mighty rush, and he does not let them flow forth one by one but makes them crowd and dash upon each other. For the words come in such 
quantity that a single voice is inadequate to utter them. I do not approve of this philosopher. His speech, like his life, should be composed. And nothing that rushes headlong and is hurried is well ordered. That is why Homer, the rapid style, which sweeps down without a break like a snow squall, is assigned to the younger speaker. From the old man's eloquence flows gently sweeter than honey. Therefore, mark my words, that forceful manner of speech, rapid and copious, is more suited to a, mount, a mountebank than to a man who is discussing and teaching an important serious subject. But I object just as strongly as he should drip out of his words as he should go atop, at top speed. He should neither keep the ear or the stretch or nor definite. For that poverty stricken and thin spun style also makes the audience less attentive because they are weary of its stammering slowness. Nevertheless, the word which has been long waited sinks in more easily than the world which flits past us on the wing. Finally, people, speaking of handing down precepts to their pupils, but not, but one is not handling down, I'm sorry, handing down that which eludes the grasp. Besides, speech that deals with the truth should be unadorned and plain. This popular style has nothing to do with the truth. Its aim is to impress the common herd, to ravish heedless ears by its speed. It does not offer itself for discussion, but snatches itself away from discussion. But how can that speech govern others which cannot itself be governed? May I not also remark that all speech which is employed for the purpose of healing our minds ought to sink into us. Remedies do not avail unless they remain in the system. Besides, this, sported, this sort of speech contains a great deal of sheer emptiness. It has more sound than power. My terrors would be quieted, my irritation soothed, my illusions shaken off, my indulgences checked, my greed rebuked, and which of these cures can be brought in a hurry? What physician can heal his patient on a flying visit? May I add that such a jargon is confused and ill-chosen? Words cannot afford pleasure either. No, just as you are well satisfied in the majority of cases to have seen through tricks which you did not think could possibly be done. So in the case of these word gymnasts, to have heard them once is ample, amply sufficient. So, I'm sorry. For what can a man desire to learn or to imitate in them? What is he to think of their souls when their speech is sent into the charge in utter disorder and cannot be kept in hand? Just as when you run downhill, you cannot stop at the point where you had decided to stop, but your steps are carried along by the momentum of your body and are borne beyond the place where you wish them to halt. So is the speed of speech that has no control over itself, nor is it seemly for philosophy, since philosophy should be carefully placed, should carefully place our words, not fling them around, and should proceed step by step. What then, you say, should not philosophy sometimes take a loftier tone? Of course, she said, but dignity of character should be preserved. And this is stripped away by such violence and excess force that philosophy possess great forces, but kept well under control. Let her stream flow unceasingly, but never become a torrent. And I should hardly allow even to an order a rapidity, a rapidity of speech like this, which cannot be called back, which goes lawlessly ahead. For how could it be followed by jurors who are often inexperienced and untrained? Even when the order is carried away by his desire to show off his powers or by uncontrollable emotion, even when he should not quicken his pace and heap up words to an extent greater than the ear can endure, 
You will be acting rightly, therefore, if you do not regard those men who seek how much they can say rather than how they sh how shall they say it. And if for yourself you choose to provide a choice must be made to speak as Publius Vinicius the Stammerer does. When Asilius asked how Vinicius spoke, he replied gradually. It was a remark of Geminus Varius, by the way. I don't see how you can call the man eloquent. Why can't he get out three words together? Why then should you not choose to speak as Vincent, Vincidius does. Though, of course, some wag may come across your path like the person who said, when Vincinius is, was dragging out his words one by one, as if he were dictating and not speaking, say, haven't you heard, haven't you say, haven't you anything to say? And yet, that where the, I'm sorry, and yet that were the better choice. For the rapidity of Quintus Haterius, the most famous order of his age is, in my opinion, to be avoided by a man of sense. Haterius never hesitated, never paused. He made only one start and only one stop. However, I suppose that certain types of speech are more or less suitable to nations also. In a Greek, you can put up with a unrestrained style. But e we as Romans, even when writing, have become accustomed to, our se to separate our words. And our compatriot Cicero, with whom Roman oratory sprang into prominence, was also a slow pacer. The Roman language is more inclined to take stock of itself, to weigh, and to offer something worth weighing. Fabianus, a man noteworthy because of his knowledge, because of his life, his knowledge, and less important than either of these, his eloquence also, used to discuss a subject with dispatch rather than with taste. Hence, you might call it ease rather than speed. I approve this quality in this wise man, but I do not demand it. Only let his speech proceed unhampered, though I prefer that it should be deliberately uttered rather than spouted. However, I have this further reason for frightening you away from the latter malady. Namely, you could only be successful in practicing this style by losing your sense of modesty. You would have to rub all shame from your countenance and refuse to hear yourself speak. For that headless, heedless flow will carry with it many expressions which you would criti wish to criticize. And I repeat, you could not attain it and at the same time preserve your sense of shame. Moreover, you would not need to practice every day and transfer your attention from subject matter to words. But words, even if they came to you readily and flowed without any exertion on your part, yet would have to be kept under control. For just as a less ostentatious gait become a philosopher, so does a restrained style of speech far removed from boldness. Therefore, the ultimate kernel of my remark is this. I bid you be slow of speech. Farewell. If anyone has any questions or comments, you can type exclamation point in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, I can start. So as a speech and debate person and a former coach, I can attest to when he kept talking about the speeding of speech, one thing that debaters did in talking was that they would try to cram a whole bunch of information in a six minute speech. And one of the things that we as judges would say to him, them is that, and especially in the beginning of the round, we would say to them, you can talk fast because we understand that you have information that you need to get through. However, if we can't write it down and we can't understand it, it doesn't count. And I think that's what Seneca is talking about here is that there's, there are speakers that, you know, want to say a whole bunch of words, but it doesn't really mean anything. I think 
if one wants to get their words out and really get their feelings with it, like gives part of themselves to it, I think you you talk in a way that's deliberate because you want people to understand where you're coming from. Whereas if you're just trying to impress people by you know giving lofty words with really no meaning, then what is the point of you doing it? And I think that goes at the heart of it. And it, it, I love that he talked about the stutterer, you know, that only got out like three words and, you know, people were like, how, you know, how could you look at that? He's trying to get out his thoughts and he's, you know, and he's doing a better job of expressing what you want rather than just trying to impress people or just trying to like, just get a whole bunch of information out there. And um, I think when people do that too, they don't want you to be able to disagree with them or refute them. So I I think that's why Seneca speaks so much about it and, and he's so against it, like this fast talking speech. And we can see it in politicians today, you know, they're they're fast talking, they like to get out a bunch of words that don't mean anything. It's because they don't want you to know what they're saying, really. So um, those are just my thoughts. Um, up next, I have Joe, followed by Katie. Joe. Yeah, actually, I think you made a lot of good points, uh, uh, Um, You know, I, I think number one, uh, he's thinking about the reason you're saying it in the first place, the purpose behind why are you speaking? And if you are speaking simply to uh, to win praise from other people, the crowds, so to speak, then in that particular instance, you're not seeking truth so that your words are not necessarily um, uh, and have any meaningful meaning. And not only that, there's a certain level of intention that actually goes along with when you're actually using words, every, you're making every word matter. So I think uh, it's also a level of modesty that is included in this. Uh, when you're not necessarily, if you're not searching for praise of other people and you're actually just speaking as uh, a way of getting to the truth, and not necessarily having to be right about something, then that's a much deeper and much more meaningful and much more virtuous way of approaching speech. So I think that um, uh, when you know he's essentially assessing people that are almost like sophists in a way of that time, I would guess, in the sense that they're actually seeking to, um, to fool somebody as opposed to actually, uh, you know, have a, a, a genuine search for what is true. Uh, and he actually says something in there, I don't have the exact, um, uh, I think it's like, I don't know, something about um, searching for something about truth in there at one point. But anyway, um, also, if you think there are people that try and spin language, we see this quite often, even today, uh, where they're trying to speak quickly and uh, use words and not necessarily, they're looking to confuse people in certain circumstances. Uh, and so with that, that doesn't, that has no virtue either, you know, and that actually is you're looking to fool people. So, um, I think that that's uh, something that, and if you're talking about, you know, obviously virtue being the aim of all of our words, uh, and that that also fits in. Um, lastly, you're not careless with your words. Uh, so I think the idea that you're, um, uh, when you're just talking really fast and you're just saying and trying to maybe speak over somebody or again, win an argument, you're not necessarily you're just saying things sometimes. Uh, and um, uh, so those, yeah, those are some of my comments uh, initially anyway. It's a lack of modesty. Um, you know, the 
purpose of communication in the first place, um, the importance of being clear, and um, ultimately the desire to have uh, to discover something that's true, truthful, as opposed to just winning an argument for the argument's sake. Thank you, Jill. Um, up next, I have Katie followed by Gary. It reminds me of something that someone once said. He said, it's clear if people think it's clear, it's not clear. If, it, if you think it's clear, but they don't think it's clear, then it's not clear. It's like, it's like from the perspective of the people receiving it. Um, I think that's what Joe was getting at. Like the point of communication is to, to to connect and pe make people understand something. It's not to try to demonstrate, uh, you know, your 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 knowledge on the subject, but uh, to communicate. Thank you, Katie. Uh, up next, I have Gary. And if anybody else has any questions or comments, you could type exclamation in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, I, I only have a silly observation, which is we just read the one on not quoting all this stuff. And then he goes into this whole thing where all he does is just quote people back to back to back. And I was just like so amused, amused by the, by the, and I realized it was different. It wasn't like adages and, and pithy sayings and stuff like that. He was using examples. He was a real scientist about it. Uh, but the contrast between the two speeches that we read back, two letters that we read back to back, uh, just really tickled me. <laughs> and um, apart from that, I was actually thinking um, along the same lines that you did, Evanique, is um, uh, for a paper I was working on a while back, I spent a lot of time in rhetoric and, and Greek rhetoric and Roman rhetoric and, and all the annuals and how it goes and how they write and how they present. Um, and so it, it was interesting just his presentation and what he was talking about and how, you know, lots of times in rhetoric, we're trying to win people over sometimes with crafty presentations that aren't necessarily, you know, filled with facts and data. You made that point up with politicians that speak and don't really have anything to say. Um, they're just emoting people and, and trying to move crowds. And so, yeah, it was really kind of a refreshing, a refreshing letter. Uh, but yeah, that was my big observation was just the contrast between the two letters. That is funny. I, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And I think, um, I don't think those uh, philosophers would exactly be flattered by what Seneca was saying. <laughs> I think he was using the, their words and their style against them. <laughs> so that, that makes it even kind of funnier. Um, up next, I have Maritza. Yeah, I'm pretty amused by Gary's observation as well. Um, you know, this this calls to mind, you know, we've spoken here before about this authenticity, you know, the concept of authenticity. So I, basically that's what I'm hearing in this letter, the, the call for us to, you know, if you, slow down your speech. I don't, I mean, I'm sure they're talking a literal cadence and pace, but I think it's also, it's not the literal slow down that is being um, admonished here. It's this concept of allow for your brain to have heard what you intend to say prior to it coming out of your mouth. Um, you know, a thing once heard cannot be unheard. So if we are beings seeking to live with intent um, or authenticity, it behooves us to allow for our brain to hear what we're going to say before we subject anyone else to hearing what we're going to say. Because once said, it cannot be unsaid. And like, you know, Evanique was just saying, maybe these philosophers are, would not appreciate the manner in which they're being quoted. And yet they have no say over it. That is something that is outside the realm of their control. Once it is put out into the world, 
you can't control how others will use your words. So, you know, um, present them sparingly and almost with caution. I think, um, especially if you're talking about um, something that may have negative uh, connotation, like a criticism, um, or something that you're going to say with absolute confidence, because if you don't actually have this absolute confidence, it may come back to you in a manner for in a manner which you cannot defend. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm hearing here. I love the turn of phrase here. Dign dignity of character should be preserved. Um, and I think that that is, um, that is a fantastic way of saying that you should think before you speak. Because ultimately, that's what this letter is all about. It's the idea of, you know, don't just let your tongue get away with you, you know, pause and consider. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maritza. Um, one thing that I just wanted to bring up really quick before um, I go to Shane Marie is when you were talking about, you know, thinking before you speak. And it's so funny in Proverbs 15, going back to the Bible, it says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. And I think that kind of goes along with what you were saying. And I think in a sense, what Seneca is saying is that, you know, if you if your intentions are good, even if you have to like course correct somebody or tell somebody something that they may not want to hear, but they may absolutely need to hear. And, you know, you got to think of how it's going to come across. And not to say that you're not like, you know, you have to speak the truth. I think that's key, but it's saying they think carefully to make sure that the message that they want to get out of their head is going to come out instead of like, it's just coming off wrong. And then you've heard the person and the, your point didn't get across. So I thought that was really great. So thank you for that. Um, Thank you, Shane Marie, for waiting. Sure. Um, I liked the, the reference uh, where he says that you can't hand down that which eludes the grasp. And the, the notion of remedies do not avail unless they remain in the system. So it, it seems to me, if you like you're suggesting, if you're careful with your words, then you can plant a seed in the mind of someone that they can chew on, not just in that moment, beyond, but beyond that moment and potentially grasp it over time. So um, that's like a, a beautifully crafted message can extend beyond the moment so that, so that those who don't grasp it right away can sit with it and, and eventually potentially grasp it, which I think is a beautiful concept. Thank you, Shane Marie. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? on this or anything that we've discussed tonight. Um, I'll give you another 30 seconds and then if not, I will attempt to sum it up. Um, it will not be like Cherie Cott does it. So <laughs> do not expect that level of excellence because that's not coming from me. Um, but I will attempt to summarize well, my takeaways from tonight and the discussion of the actual four passages, which is kind of cool that we got to tonight. Um, so with that, um, we started off in 37 and, um, and my notes are a little out of order, so I'm just going to go with takeaways and not be specific. So the first takeaway I got is, you know, I thought when Seneca was talking about like being with like-minded people and, and going in that way and then hearing people speak about it, I, I think I think the group is right, which is like why the group is so fun. And I think it is not only, you know, looking at it, these are moral letters and, you know, having people in your life that align with your values and your um you know, with your values and where you're going and where you're going, not only like 
with goals, but with values. And I think the values and the morals are more important. You want people that um, have this, either not have the same exact morals, but they call you higher, I think, you know, in, in the way that they think. So you don't have to think the same way. Um, I think Rogine and I want to say Shane Marie were talking about, you know, how sometimes we can just kind of like, and Maritza was talking about how we could just kind of like want to go to our own group and just kind of hang there. But, you know, to have people that have the same values as, as you doesn't mean that you necessarily agree or disagree on the same things, but it they call you to a moral high ground and not in a way that's pretentious, but in a way, I always say it's based on the way a person lives. Like you see a person and you know people in your life that live a certain way and you're like, I want to live that way because that aligns with my values and that aligns with who I strive to be. And I think it's who they are. It's not so much, you know, just what they say. It's about who they are and how they're living their life. So I think in that sense, like that is the first takeaway that I got. Um, another part, which Joe said was, um, you know, uh, you, that your actions are aligning with your values. And I think that was great too, because I, I, I think that's key. Like we always wonder how we should act in the world or how should we should take action or what should we take action on? And I think that's a pretty good way of saying you know, does it align with your values? And if so, go ahead. And even if it doesn't work out, you were doing what you valued and what aligned with your values and with your morals and with your virtues. So I thought that was great. Um, I think um, I think being present is key as well. Um, being in the moment and doing things in the moment that align with your values and where you want to go in life is key as well. And, and acting now, and I think that was a big part of one of the letters where uh, Seneca calls us to act now because now is all we have. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. You can't change the past, but you can, you can not Role in now, but you can act in the now, and I think that goes back to another point that I got reasonable in our in our actions and you know how we proceed. That's the only thing that we can really control, um, and I think it's a key to resilience. You know, there's things that are going to happen in life that you just can't control. But the only thing that you control you can control is the actions you take um, after, and it doesn't mean that you don't have the emotions. Is that you don't act out of those emotions. And I think the key to not acting out of the emotions is to recognize the emotions. And I think that's something you said, Maritza, is that, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but I think you were saying something earlier about, um, you know, like not acting out of our emotions, but, you know, the Stoics do not say that we don't have them. And I think we have to recognize them in order to see if we are in fact acting out of them. And if we are, we can course correct. So those were um, some of my takeaways. So if anybody else has any final thoughts before we conclude, please type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. And if not, um, have a great night. 